catch up with Tony Stark as he gets back to the business of owning his business after taking it back from Fei Long. Unfortunately, the forces of evil are working to take it away again. Who or what is behind Tony's latest troubles? Let's find out in Iron Man number one from Marvel Comics. See you in three. Welcome back to Comical Opinions. This is our review of Iron Man number one. You know, it's fair to say that bringing in guest writers with little to no track record of writing superhero comics can be a hit or miss proposition. Spencer Ackerman, who most notably developed a career as a journalist for publications such as Wired, The Daily Beast, and The Guardian, tries his hand at writing for Marvel with one of the world's most recognizable characters. Does an outsider's perspective and a fresh pair of eyes give readers an exciting take on Iron Man number one? Well, eh. Uh, that depends on your tolerance for a mild to moderate cringe. Before we dig into the issue, let's level set on where Tony Stark is right now in the timeline. Iron Man number one follows the events of the fall of Krakoa, the subsequent battle against Orcus and their AI uh, overtaking, if you will, and Tony Stark's takedown of Fei Long and his Stark Sentinels. During that cavalcade of conflicts, Tony helped defeat Orcus by building a suit of armor made of the fabled Mysterium alloy he obtained through his, shall we call it, temporary marriage to Emma Frost, while Fei Long was in control of Stark Industries. In other words, the Mysterium armor is Tony Stark's private property. Keep that in mind because it plays a part in what happens during the issue. The issue begins with Iron Man flying in during a dispute between Stark workers meeting to unionize and a couple of guards at one of Fei Long's converted Stark Sentinel plants. The workers try to force the gates open to have their union formation meeting, but the guards refuse. Instead of calling the police, like anybody would normally think to do, the guards suddenly transform into Hulk-sized purplish brutes and attack the workers outside the plant gates. Iron Man intervenes and sends the hulking guards packing. Almost immediately, questions abound. If the workers are meeting to form a union, why do they have to do it inside the Stark Sentinel plant, a plant that should not be making any more Stark Sentinels? Where did Fei Long get a pair of security guards who turned into these purplish ogre type creatures? And why are they still guarding a shut down Stark Sentinel plant? Tony arrives wearing one of his older armor models instead of the Mysterium armor, but why? Tensions in the world are at an all time high after the conflict between the mutants and Orcus. That's what the whole From the Ashes era is all about. And he was an active participant in that era. So why would he not keep the world's most advanced and dangerous Iron Man armor handy? Boy. We're already off to a good start. Now with the guards gone, Tony escorts the workers into the plant so that they can discuss unionization and continue manufacturing. But it turns out the plant has been converted into making artillery shells. In other words, the plant is still making weapons, but less genocidal weapons than Stark Sentinels. Fearing the workers may lose their jobs if he shuts down the plant, Tony agrees to keep the plant running until they can figure out what to make that isn't so lethal because workers' rights are more important than stopping the manufacturing of weapons of mass destruction under the Stark brand. There's a communist saying, if you're familiar with that ideology, it's workers of the world unite, and that feels very much like what's going on here. So yeah, that's pretty much what you're in for here with this issue. The unionization efforts have no bearing on the rest of the issue. So it seems Spencer Ackerman introduced the scene simply to make a statement about unions, workers' rights, and the importance of workers owning the decisions of what they produce. This opener should give you a pretty solid clue about what Ackerman's approach is to this material, his attitudes towards Tony Stark, and the kind of comic that you're going to get. After the workers meeting is done, Tony puts the armor back on and flies away. His armor, however, suddenly loses power in midair, sending him crashing to the ground below. The fall breaks most of the bones in his body, sending him to the hospital for several weeks of rest, recuperation, and PT. As a result, the hospital stay atrophied every limb in his body, so his slow recovery puts him in a bad physical state. Weeks later, Tony flies to a board meeting, again without the Mysterium armor, where he proposes a way to overcome the loss of revenue from getting out of the weapons business. His bright idea? To create a gambling app where users bet on the outcome of superhero fights against villains. The proposal gets, as you would expect, a tepid response. In turn, the board makes a proposal of their own, led by former S.H.I.E.L.D. agent Melinda May and Jack Cooning Jr. The board is entertaining, get this, a buyout proposal as long as Stark Industries continues to make weapons by a joint venture between AIM and Roxxon. With the speed with which everything is getting thrown at Tony and also some notes written back from the letters page at the end of the issue, 
Ackerman is throwing everything at Tony all at once to bring him low, but we've now sort of dipped into silly territory. Why would Tony Stark, a man who knows the pain and destruction of addiction, propose the creation of a gambling app? Why would anyone entertain a buyout proposal from AIM, a known terrorist for hire organization? Why is a buyout a valid plot point when the mergers between multi-billion dollar companies and corporations take months or years worth of vetting by the Federal Trade Commission? If Ackerman wants to make a statement about evil corporations propagating evil with endless money, which is very clear from the tone here, he's got to be smarter than this, or at least not treat the readers like they're stupid. Later after the board meeting, Tony sits back in his apartment and helplessly lets the wheels of big business churn on without lifting a finger to stop the buyout. One night, Tony scrolls through social media in his helmet's heads-up display and happens to see a post from Flying Tiger, taunting Iron Man to come get him. Iron Man suits up, again, not the Mysterium armor, and finds Flying Tiger and Tiger Shark together trashing an empty laundromat. Iron Man wins the brief tussle, but he learns the whole fight was a setup for Flying Tiger to live stream the battle. Flying Tiger's admissions after the fight led Tony to believe his recent armor troubles are due to a subtle magic attack. The purpose and outcome of the fight with Flying Tiger and Tiger Shark isn't clear. It has a very sort of out of the blue setup to it and it has a very hello fellow kids kind of vibe. Who hired them? What does any of this have to do with magic? How did he ascertain that magic was the source of his troubles? Why and how are the tiger adjacent villains live streaming the fight without Tony noticing a big camera set up right in the middle of the street in front of the laundromat? This entire sequence appears to have no point other than to open Tony's eyes to the fact that magical forces are against him, which wouldn't be a problem, again, if he was wearing his Mysterium armor. Finally, after weeks of not taking a hint, Tony takes the hint. He flies off to get his Mysterium armor, which he stores in an unguarded, unsecured, unmonitored Long Island warehouse. When he arrives, he's immediately attacked by those purplish hulkish security guards from the Workers' Rebellion at the beginning of the issue. After he quickly defeats the Brutes, Tony is confronted by the real mastermind of all his troubles, a resurrected Justine Hammer who took Tony's unguarded, unsecured, unmonitored Mysterium armor and converted herself into the new Ironmonger, operating on behalf of the aim Roxxon joint venture. It's unclear how and why Justine gets to walk away with Mysterium armor as quote-unquote Stark property, when it's Tony's private property to begin with. We covered that in the beginning. The issue ends with Tony getting the stuffing knocked out of him, of course, because Justine Hammer is wearing Mysterium armor. Justine takes a limo ride home to help complete the completely legal and shockingly quick acquisition of Stark Industries and Workers of the World Unite. All right, let's talk about the positives and negatives, starting with what's great about Iron Man number one. The highlight of the issue is the art. Julius Ota has a cornucopia of scenes to stretch his artistic muscle, from fights with purple hulkish security guards to wildly dramatic board meetings that are strange in and of themselves, to an appearance of the Tiger Squad, which is what they call themselves, and also a cool new variant of the Ironmonger armor using Mysterium. You get a little bit of everything in this buffet for the eyes, and it's a visual treat, and most of the score of this issue that's positive is due to the art. And so let's talk about what's not great about Iron Man number one. Spencer Ackerman's main plot, the execution, and the fundamental understanding of Tony Stark are exactly what you would expect from a writer without experience writing Iron Man. This comic doesn't star Iron Man. Iron Man number one is the writer's self-insert wearing a Tony Stark skin, and that's about as clear and accurate a way as you could put it. There are several examples that lead me to this conclusion. Given the fallout from Orcus and Krakoa, Tony would never leave his Mysterium armor unattended. It's too expensive, it's too precious, it's too dangerous. Tony would never let his company get taken over by AIM and Roxxon so easily or without a fight. He basically puts up no resistance to the takeover. Tony would never allow weapons manufacturing to continue for the sake of just saving jobs. I mean, it's nice that Ackerman wants to make a point about unions and workers' rights, but that does not apply when we're talking about weapons of mass destruction. And Tony would never propose a gambling app to make money. Tony has a long and painful history with addiction. The last person in the world who would be offering up a gambling app is Tony Stark. So if you combine your knowledge of Iron Man and Tony Stark and take all those examples into account, you recognize these are things that maybe Spencer Ackerman would do, but these are not things Tony Stark would do. And that's the difference between a guest writer who can write an established IP and the ones who can't. This is not a good example of 
and a guest writer writing an established IP. Final thoughts, what do we think about Iron Man number one? To be fair, it's a frustrating, annoying, and in some cases, utterly off-putting first issue. New Marvel writer Spencer Ackerman puts Tony Stark through the ringer by making a series of boneheaded mistakes and inconsistent decisions that don't remotely align with Tony's character. This issue isn't an Iron Man comic. It's a comic starring Spencer Ackerman wearing Iron Man skin, and it's not going to move the needle for this character or for Marvel one little bit. Therefore, Iron Man number one earns a 5 out of 10. Some may feel this score is a little too harsh, but when you misunderstand a character this badly, I can't let that slide. But what do you think? Is Tony Stark's refocus on communism and social media more to your liking? Leave a thumbs up if it is and drop a comment below with what socio-political challenge Tony Stark should address next. Uh, I don't know, maybe world hunger? Who knows? Also, remember to click on the link in the description to read the written review, check out the variant covers and preview pages, and buy this comic to help support the channel. Your support, of course, is always greatly appreciated. So thank you very much for joining, and stay tuned through the outro for more reviews just like this one.